Hi, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Sal's House. Really glad to be here with you back from Australia. You've probably heard me on the radio already or on the Always Game Day in Buffalo podcast with Matt Bove. Some great stories from Australia that I'll be sharing throughout. You know, went to a rugby match, uh, saw some really incredible, cool things, animals, fed some kangaroos, held a koala, had a bird called a Kukarabu, Kukarabu, I think it was called, has a very distinct sound. Anyway, lots of stuff to talk about from Australia, but back here in the United States and yes, ready to get back into Sal's house with some terrific guests. Before I welcome in my next guest today, I want to thank the sponsor, of course, as usual, Sports City Pizza Pub here on Sal's House, 1407 Niagara Street in Buffalo. Great wings, great pizza, beer, drinks. We did uh, a watch party for the NCAA uh, there, I was there with a bunch of college basketball coaches, jumped behind the bar. It was for coaches versus cancer. It was a great time for those of you who came by. Thank you. For those of you who are part of the show. Thank you. I know maniac came by as part of the show. Maddie glad for the bills came by. Uh, she was behind the bar a little bit there. So quite a few people had a great time there. Want to thank sports city pizza pub as always for being a sponsor here on Sal's house. All right, let's get right to it. My guest today on the show is a very good friend of mine and I say that because, you know, sometimes in this business we say, oh, good friend of mine, because, you know, you just get to know somebody and you become a little closer. I've known actually this guy since right when I moved back to Buffalo in about 2011, because we started doing media together. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And he's a former Buffalo Bill. His name is Marlon Kerner. And Marlon's going to join the program right now. Marlon, thank you very much for joining me on Sal's House, my man. I, I, I love having you on and talking ball with you. And, and I appreciate you being on. I appreciate our friendship for so many years. Yes, same as me. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I, you you took me back. Like I forgot it was a long, long, long time, long time ago. ago when you were like, I just came back and I'm trying to figure this. I'm like, I love it. Welcome back. You should I know. Stay thank you. Back. Yeah. And listen, that was a long time ago. You and I, let's start there. We did a show on Time Warner Cable, now Spectrum, called <laughs> The Enforcers. And love the Enforcers. Ruben. <laughs> Ruben Brown, Rob Ray. And Andrew Peters, and they are the enforcers. And you are another pro, pro athlete who played defense, the highest of levels. I'm just the guy who got of sat there and, you know, was talking about sports between you. But how cool was that show? You remember that show when we were first starting out and David D producing back in the uh, old Spectrum building on Indian Church Road? Man, I love that, buddy. It was so much fun driving there to go just record that show. Uh, it was impromptu. I yeah. never knew what anybody was going to say, but I thought we played so well off each other. Oh yeah, we picked up on all the little nuances. We could pick up a little, little, little body trait and then go with something that somebody said. I still say four players are the toughest. Uh, don't hate me, hockey players. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we, we had that debate, and then we gave the nod to those hockey players. Yeah, I think the guy played and skated on a broken leg. I was like, yeah, I'm not even doing that. There's no way I would do that and consider that. I can't and how about guys like Rob and Andrew fighting on skates? Like, what is that? That's incredible. That's amazing. Um, so I was like, you know what? We'll give hockey players a nod. Uh, we'll make them tough guys, honorary tough guys for this episode. For sure. And uh, those were fun days, though. And you go back and you think about everybody and kind of where they've gone. Look at Rob now. Rob's the the. I don't know if Rob was at the time. He might have been doing Sabres games. I don't think he was uh, no, at the time. I think Maybe he was not. about to. He was doing a couple of them. Right. Because um, I think it was. I forget who the other guy. It was somebody else before. It, and then he decided to go a different way. And Mike so, Robitaille might have still been on the games. Robitaille I was I there, think. and then there yep. was a, um, another player mm -hmm. that was, they were trying to figure out if they wanted to bring him on or not. And then yep. they they gave the nod to Razor, and 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 I, ironically, I'm going to my first ever Sabres game tomorrow. No way! Are you, we're going to be there too. Going yeah. to. By the way, for anybody listening to this, we're recording on Wednesday, uh, April 10th. The Sabres' last home game of the season is Thursday, April 11th. And it's their in again not making the playoffs thirteen straight years. Um, how hey, how come you don't go a lot? And B, why are you going to this one? We have um, NFLPA alumni event at the Sabers game, so they were like, "You should come." I'm like, "Okay, I'll come." But I always held out for I wanted that whole experience of this is my first game. I wanted the T-shirt. I wanted to put this thing on social media. Like I'm going to my first ever Sabers game. Yeah. So uh, for some reason, I never really got into hockey, even though. I was here with um, the skate in the crease um, and Dominic Hashig and all those guys. Like I was here, I, I watched it um, and I, I can watch hockey. I understand the game because Robin and Andrew helped me understand it and made me watch it. So I understood the game. Um, but for some reason, I just never. So this is your first game ever, not just this year. Ever. First game ever. First game. Wow. Ever. 
I am yeah. stunned. I'm glad that you're breaking this news here on South House because that is super cool. We'll be there tomorrow. I know Max would love to see you. I haven't seen you. I mean, man, it, how, how quick does everyone grow, right? I mean, you have kids when we were starting off and doing our shows. So that would have been around 2012 or so because I right. came back in 11. I think we're doing Enforcers like 2012, 2013, like Stevie Johnson era, back with the yes. Bills, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick. Why so serious? Yes. <laughs> Why? That's right. Um, Your kids, man, how, how old are they now? I mean, how old would they have been then? That would have been I'm uh, on 10, 11 years ago. Year birthday. So this is all the odd years. Um, so my youngest just turned 19 wow. last week. Um, he, I, I, Actually, a week ago today. Um, so he turned 19. My daughter turns 21 um, in June. Amazing. And then my oldest turns 23 um, in July. Uh, so kudos to my wife because she kept them all two years apart. So uh, I don't know how <laughs> she did that, but she, yeah, she, she got me. Um, she got me good and she, she spaced it out. But I have a college graduate oh. and um, a, 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 my daughter's finishing junior year um, at Hilbert College. And my youngest is a freshman finishing up. All of this was at ECC. So I'm kind of like night at the light at the end of the tunnel, trying to figure out what, what I'm going to do next. And I'm planning the 25th anniversary trip for next year. So I love it. I love it. What did you do? You, by the way, you are literally like two weeks older than me. We're the sa exact same age. You were born March 18th, yes. 1973. Yes. I was born April 4th, 1973. We are very similar in age. We're very close in age. Um, we have these kids that are my, my, my son, as you know, is 10 years old now. Um, you know, but we have a lot of, I think things in common when it comes to like being at a certain age and sports and growing up. And I want to get to that in a minute, but when it comes to kids, you have three, I've won, but everyone says what it goes by quick. And then you it don't know nice. until so you bad. actually experience it. Yes. I mean, I laugh because I'm looking at old pictures and it seems like yesterday we were bringing one home and you're super careful and and once you have multiple kids, then pe like parents will tell you, like, you go really crazy on the first kid. You're so protective. Oh, you know, yeah. I, oh, you fall. I'm going to pick you up. I'm a, I'm kissing your knee and all those things. And then when you get the second one, you're like, hey, listen, like, man, you gonna be all right. And you get to the third one, like, listen, put some dirt on it. <laughs> <laughs> Just get up. You'll be fine. I know. There's like that old commercial. I remember there's a commercial and um, it's like shows this couple and they have their first baby and they're interviewing babysitters and like they're literally like calling every reference in the book and then like by the third kid they're like yeah have you ever done this before good i don't care here's the keys you know what yeah, i mean it's, it doesn't out. matter <laughs> you've already been through it um going back real quick and then of course andrew i mean i'm really happy for the success andrew's had in the media you know what i mean yes. um to see where he's risen with craig and of course they were on wgr for a while they went and did their own thing and that was their choice but they've, they've done an amazing job with their podcast uh, after the whistle, I really enjoy it. And they can be themselves. And if you ever listen to that show, which I'm sure you have, it really is Andrew and Craig's personality coming out, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. And, and that's the best thing. That's what you want. Like, I love podcasts because the podcast forum allows you just to be you. Yeah. Right? Like, I think sometimes you forget and you get caught up in the politics of the station wants it to look this way. They're looking for certain ratings. And so sometimes they make business decisions and then you have to make a business decision, which they did. But I love it because it's authentically both of them. They just get to act them. And and we know PD, we know how silly he is. That's we know right. that what he's going to say. I, I, I'm looking like I, I know he's going to say something crazy and off the wall right now. So it's just fun for them to see how they've taken their own personalities and then really then regained the following, you know, took the following back that they had added more people and now everybody's like the go-to you go listen to them when you want to hear something like because they're going to tell you the truth they know they're going to tell you the truth and what they've seen and that's the best that's the best way of being authentic and really just staying true to your audience and so i love listening to him because i'm like that's pd 100 percent. yeah I, I love it too and then ruben he's just jet setting man you never know where, where <laughs> ruben is and when right i actually um you know ruben and i ruben and i have stayed in contact which i'm sure you have as well he's just such yeah. a great dude he really is and I, I was in New York city like two years ago during the summer. And he's like, dude, you, we got to hook up. And we were going to, and uh, he was, but he got really sick. He couldn't be there. He was like sick. He couldn't uh, meet up, but he rides his motorcycle around. He wanted yeah. to come meet me out. And I was going to, I was going to go to a, a Syracuse bar to watch Syracuse game. And he was going to come meet me out. We never did, but I've seen him when he comes back to training camp. He's a real dude. He's just a real yep. dude. I, I love that guy. Real dude. Like one of the dudes that should be on the wall of fame at some mm -hmm. point in time, whenever that tradition gets brought back. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we were the same draft class. So I love it. Ruben and I go way back and we played against each other in college. So 
I got to see him twice uh, when we went to Pittsburgh and beat him. And then when they came to Columbus and we beat him. So I, <laughs> I love it. Like, look, we beat you twice, man. Like, you don't have anything to say because I'm 2-0 and against Pittsburgh. Like, we never lose. We never lost a game. I am so glad you just – what a great segue. See, this is why I knew, you, you've been in media. You knew where I was going. You didn't, but you gave me a great opportunity to go there, which is um, college and you being drafted. Third round, 1995. Yes. Um, okay, so if I remember this right, I think you told me a story one time about when you were drafted and your sister had the phone maybe and you yeah, didn't know – you're right. Am I right? This is the story. You're right. right. Can you, yeah. Can, can you share it, everybody, all of our listeners, what that story is? Yeah. So, again, I, I one, I didn't know the Bills were interested in me. Like, um, mm-hmm. like the first time I had any conversation with the Bills was at my pro day, um, and I ran a really good forty. I ran a four three five, and I'm feeling all good about myself. Like, all right, I ran great. And Joey Gallery ran like immediately after me. And he ran a four one seven, and then everybody's like, "You were the opening Bobby. act. You were you were just the like, opening." Forget act. about this dude. Like, who's this slow dude? This guy ran a four one seven, and I'm sitting like, "Thanks, Joey. Thanks for stealing my thunder." Yeah. Uh, but the Bills, the only contact I had was I think it was John Butler and somebody else. I was like, "What did you eat for breakfast?" I said, I, "I had pancakes. I went to McDonald's, and I had their big breakfast with pancakes." And then I came in and just I had all this carb energy ready to go, and I just like yeah. I unleashed it. And had a good run with the 40, had a good drill, all the DB drills. And that was it. And then I had no idea they were they were interested in, in signing me or drafting me. And so um, I'll, I'll preface how the day went uh, so people can get it. Uh, but that I, we're, I'm old enough to tell people now, like the NFL draft and how it looks with the, the spectacle and the being on Thursday night. And everybody's like tuning in to NFL Network. We didn't have that. It was ESPN, noon. You go from noon to 7.30 on ESPN, and then right at 7.30, it switches right off to ESPN2 and runs to like about 11.30, sometimes midnight, until the third round was complete. They had all the third round picks and everything done and completed, and then they would come back on on Sunday and finish the rest of it out until they got through round seven. Um, Because I think my draft was either the first draft or the second draft where they got rid of like the 10th round, the ninth round, all that. It went to seven rounds, and that was it. Uh, So... I'm just kind of relaxing. I know I'm not really going to go. I don't think I'm going on the first day. I know I'm not going at 1230. Like, I'm not in this this conversation. So I had a barbecue. I'm, I'm hanging out with family and friends. We throw some steaks on the grill. We do the, the potato salad, the spaghetti salad, all the all the good food you're going to have for a barbecue where they're hanging out, watching the draft, watching my college teammates get drafted. I want to say Joey went seven to Seattle that year. Um, we had a surprise draft with a, a Craig. Craig Powell going like late first round to the Cleveland Browns. I want to say Corey Stringer went to the Minnesota Vikings yeah. that year. So I had some really good teammates that went high in the draft. So I'm just clapping, like supporting them. Watch the second round. Uh, I think uh, one of my good friends, Chris Sanders, went a little later. So I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm cheering my guys on. And then right about 730, I'm at my aunt's house and – it's about time for the draft to switch to ESPN two. And I had been asking for a month. Do you have ESPN two? Cause remember that's when you didn't, you didn't get it. It didn't come with ESPN, ESPN one, ESPN news, ESPN uh, classic, all this stuff that we have now, it was ESPN and then ESPN two, you had to pay for, and they hadn't even, I don't think they introduced ESPN news yet back then yet. So, so it was kind of one of those weird little situations. Uh, and in Ohio, we had, the sports channel, which showed like the Cleveland Cavs, the Cleveland Indians, it showed all the kind of sports up in Cleveland and Ohio. And so she confused those two stations. So she thought she had ESPN two and she didn't. So (laughs) so I couldn't watch the ESPN two. So I didn't get to watch the second half of the drafts. So I, I I didn't get to see myself getting, uh, or my name getting called by the bills and all that stuff because I didn't have it. So I'm sitting in the house, just relaxing. And it's like, well, you know, it's late. Like, what do you guys want to do? I'm like, they're like, oh, well, let's go bowling. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like, we, we get up in the house. Like, well, let me just go check where they are in the draft because I'm not sure. So just like Sports City Pub is scrolling on the bottom of the screen. We had the ticker like that. Like, like they just scroll the draft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right across the bottom on ESPN while they were playing other sports. So I'm in there just watching the ticker. And they're like, they're in the third round. And I'm like, well, they said I could go anywhere from the third round to the sixth round. Let me just hang out for a second. But I'm in like a winter coat because it cooled off at night. So it was kind of cold. And so I'm sitting there like it's freezing here. So we're all in the house just cooling. And so my cousin, uh, we're like six months apart. 
Uh, we're same age, everything. And we're like, nobody's allowed to be on the phone. I mean, what, how do you tell a 22 year old that they can't pick up the phone when they're talking to their boyfriend? Like, yeah, she's going to sneak and pick up the phone. The phone that rang all day. Like, man, nobody's. Yeah, there's no me. texting back then. It's not like you're, no. it's not like giving the option of just texting instead. Nope. It was straight up just phone. They called <laughs> you and they would either call your agent and say we're drafting you yeah. or they would call you if you provided the phone number. And so she yells up like Marlon. And I'm like, what? And she's like, telephone. I'm like, I didn't hear the phone ring. Who's on the phone? I don't know. Some guy from the Buffalo Bills. And I saw I'm laughing. Like you can hear a pin drop in the house. And so I pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. Um, and Dwight Adam gets on the phone and I would do him injustice, but I'm gonna try anyway. Go ahead. And that. he gets on the phone and I was like, hello. And he's like, Marlon Kerner. And I'm like, uh, yes, sir. And he's like, congratulations. You're a Buffalo Bill. And I was just like, <laughs> Yeah, he has a he has a he had a like, very distinct cool. accent. Yeah, really cool. Right. I'm like, thank yeah. you so much. And I I don't even remember if he put on any of the coaches. He just talked a little bit. I I want to say John Butler got on. Was just like, hey, you know, we've been watching and following you um, for a while. You know, you had a good career. You know, we're we're excited to have you as part of the organization. And I said, okay, thank you. And I hung up the phone, hugged my mom. Um, I have a twin brother. Some people don't know I have a twin brother. I have a twin brother. So. I gave my brother a hug, um, I'm, all my family and friends hugs. And then they were like, okay, so what? So I was like, we can go bowling now. <laughs> that was it. So I literally got in the car and went bowling. And that's what we did for the night. Uh, I let it sink in and just kind of like, wow, this is kind of surreal. Like, you know, and everybody's like, how do you feel? And I'm like, I don't know how to feel yet. I'm just processing the fact that something that I wanted to do since I was four years old that I got selected to do, but I know the work is just beginning. So I was trying yeah. to figure out what that would look like. And then also figure out, like, okay, give me the history. Where's Buffalo? I know they went to four straight Super Bowls, but what am I walking into? I know they have Bruce and Thurman and Andre uh, and Jim. So what does that look like? So just trying to figure all that stuff out. While so you 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 came in. So you came in. They had four Super Bowls, and then they missed the playoffs. And you that's yeah. the year after that. That's when you get drafted. And then you guys go right to the playoffs that year. And by the way, there he is, ladies and gentlemen. There is Marlon <laughs> Kerner, 46 right there. Why would you choose 46? So 46 was a number that I got at Ohio State. Um, my high school number was 11. I was a high school quarterback, uh, but somebody, uh, one of our quarterbacks had 11. So they gave me 46. And I I knew some players um, that had wore 46. I want to say Bo Pelini wore 46. Uh, Vince Workman, uh, who was a really good running back out of Ohio State, wore 46. So I was like, okay, I'll keep the number and I'll change it at some point. That was my thought process. I'll change it. I'm probably not going to play as a freshman. So I'll just wear 46, get figured out how to play corner. Because the crazy thing is about going to Ohio State is I did not play corner in high school. <laughs> so Yeah, you were, so you were a quarterback, I was, right? I was a quarterback all the way through. Like I played a little bit of safety, but I did not play corner at all. Like there was never a moment when they were like, go out there and line up on this guy. I think when they knew that I might get recruited, um, they put me kind of as a, on a slot guy and I had never done it before. And so I didn't understand all the nuances that go along with that. So I was literally um, went to a house State football camp and ran a really fast 40. And mm -hmm. that's how I got on the radar to play corner because I ran a four, four from a three point stance um, at their football that's camp. Amazing. And so they were like, Hey, have you ever, can, can you play corner? I was like, I know how to do it, but I've never really done it like that. Um, and he said, well, go cover this guy. And I did um, like defensive backs, like go cover this guy. I'm like, where you going to be standing? Like, he's like about seven yards. I'm like right here. He's like, yeah. And so he left me there for about 10, 15 minutes covering receivers. And I knew I could run fast. So I was just like sizing guys up, like having played corner quarterback, you understood like, okay, if he gets wide, he's probably going to try to run a slant or try to run a go route or something. Yeah. So I wasn't worried about anybody outrunning me. Period. I'm like, I can run with anybody at this camp. Like, that's how confident I was in that and my speed. Then I was just kind of trying to figure out what he's going to run. But nobody caught a ball on me. Like, Who at, who, at, who else recruited you? What other schools? You you. I mean, you're an Ohio kid. So my, my guess Ohio is kid. you really, so, I mean, Ohio was probably Ohio State. Wow, that's great. You want to go there. No, but, believe it or not. <laughs> ooh, did I, were you a Michigan fan? No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely no. There would, I would never go to Michigan. <laughs> so that was never even a question. Like, they weren't even on the radar. And they sent me a letter um, recruiting me. And I was like... It's cool. I'm going to put it up on a wall to say I got recruited by Michigan, but there's no way I'm going to Michigan. That's not even going to happen. <laughs> um, so I went to Ohio State camp as a junior. And then I was kind of a nerdy athlete in high school um, because I grew up in a really bad, tough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to get out of my neighborhood. So my mom had this really like my mom was like really on me about grades, 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 grades. You got to get good grades. 
And so all the people that I hung out with got good grades. So I just kind of naturally gravitated to them to hung out with, well, they they had a 4.0, so I should have a 4.0. So those are the people that I hung out with. So I had a really good GPA, I had 3.5 GPA, 3.5 3, 3, GPA. And then we remember back when back in, it's not like it is now. You had to get an 18 on the SAT or a minimum of a 900 to be eligible to play college football. Prop 46, Prop 47, something yeah. like that it was called, like right? Prop, yeah. 40, Prop 47? Yeah, I think like so. Yeah. It was a sliding scale of yeah. grades, SATs, things like that. Yep. So you have, but like you, like minimum was 18 and 900. And then depending on the GPA, it went a little higher. Um, but back when I came out, it was just straight, like you had to get a 900. And then you had to at least have a 2.0 or, or above to get on. Um, so I took my ACT in the spring of my junior year. Okay. And then got it back and had a 23. And was like, okay, you're good. Um, like I, I know I was about going to college and then that opened the floodgates and I just started getting letters from everywhere wow. um, and from all kind of um, schools. Cause they were like, you have a good GPA. We know you can play football. And now we know you took care of your test. So you're eligible. So then I started getting um, letters from Tennessee, Ohio state, obviously, cause Ohio state, when I went to their camp, like we want to recruit you. And then once teams heard uh, like Ohio state's recruiting, then it was like, oh, well, Indiana followed suit. All the other Big Ten schools started following suit. Indiana, Purdue. Um, I remember getting that Michigan letter, Michigan State letter, UCLA letter, USC letters. So I, like I had a wall that started with just like a few letters. And then it turned into like 40 different letters that I had taped up on a wall just to kind of remind me to keep working hard. Uh, and so I was a Notre Dame fan because I was a high school okay. quarterback. Like sure. I wanted to go to Notre Dame and play quarterback. Um, and I was going to be the next Tony Rice. So Notre Dame was my school because I wanted to play college um, football and I wanted to play quarterback. Um, that was like my whole goal. Uh, and so I, I, that was my focus. And Notre Dame recruited me. Notre Dame was sending me letters. Uh, and I remember when Notre Dame came to one of my high school football games my senior year. And it was just crazy because that's all I heard all week is the scout from Notre Dame said he's going to be there. He's coming to watch you play. Okay. And we were playing one Wait, of my. Let me ask you: Were you like the top guy at your school? Or were there other guys they came to watch? Or there were other guys. Um, I was I was like one of the top seniors at my school, but there was nobody in my backfield that was graduating. Everyone okay. else like they were juniors or um sophomores. So I was the top senior prospect in my um backfield. Okay. Um, and in my quarterback room, um, so I was leaving, but. And I'll talk about my um the guys from my high school because you would believe it's like a it's like a who's who from okay. high school. You're like, oh shoot. Um, but so I get there and we're playing one of my good friends. His name is Ty Howard. He ended up going to Ohio State to play defensive back as well. Um, and and so my high school would be like playing Burgard or South Park. Like it was a city league school. We had a whole city league team. So it was 15 of us, and we were in two different divisions, like three or four, like two different divisions, and you had like four sub, like a couple of other divisions, like north, south. Um, and so we had like, and so you would play one side and you would get a city league champion. So my junior year, we won the city league championship. My senior year, we wanted to go to the state playoffs in Ohio state in Ohio. You had to have computer points, which meant you had to beat people. So people had to be really good and you had to play guys that were ranked in the system. So we played the sales. Luke fickle, um, was, um, my, one of my teammates at Ohio state and now the a head coach at Wisconsin. Wow. He went to their high school. And we, we lost to them in overtime, um, which is crazy. He, he was a good player. Um, so we we started getting some computer points. We made the state playoffs, but when we played um, that school, Notre Dame was at, and they were just like, um, my we were five and one, lost to Luke. Um, they were five or six and zero, oh, and they were just talking so much trash. Like they were just like, Marlon, we gonna beat y'all. Like this, you know, last year I was hurt. Like you not you not gonna get past us. Like, okay, and they came and played, and we beat them. We beat the breaks off of them. We beat them like thirty five to fourteen. I ended up with eight carries for 150 yards and three touchdowns after that <laughs> game it. and that was it after that i was just we were just on a roll and we we, we ended up winning uh, we lost our first game and won 11 straight game actually 12 straight games before we lost again um in the state playoffs and so it was a lot of fun and then ohio state had so much clout they got me to i got selected to the all-star game like we wanted to play corner so the first time i played a game at corner was the uh, north south um um, high school all-star game in Canton, Ohio. And then I came back to Columbus and played a second all-star game. Um, and that was it. But Notre Dame kind of went through that process. And I was just like, all right. And, and so I was a Notre Dame guy. I had 
if I, I if I had some, I'm trying to find them. I had pictures of all my senior pictures, Notre Dame gear. Mm. I had Notre Dame letters in my um, locker all taped up. I memorized their guide. Like I read all their media guide. I, I knew who the, was on the roster. Jeff Burris was going to be a teammate of mine had I decided to go to Notre Dame. But Ohio oh, State yeah. kept going like, we want you, we want you, we want you. And Ohio State wasn't good yet. They were trying to, like, turn the corner. Um, they were coming off of a, a very disappointing season, uh, and they had hired John Cooper. Yeah. Uh, and he ended up going, I want to say, eight and four, maybe seven and seven and five, his first seven and five his first year. And we got a bowl game and we lost the Air Force. Um, and so I was kind of like, ooh, we lost the Air Force. And I stuck with the process. I was just, I went through the process. I took my visit there and they called me after their bowl game loss. Like, you know, I know it was tough. Like, we're trying to turn the corner, we're trying to change how we recruit. We want to keep our talent in Ohio and state. And they recruited me and said, you know, we want you. And so after all that, I was like, okay, I'm coming. And so I called them back. I told my mom, I said, hey, I made a decision. I'm going to Ohio State. And she said, are you sure you want to do that? What about Notre Dame? I'm like, nah, you know what? I'm good. I'm not worried about Notre Dame. Like, Ohio State seems like it's the best fit for me. Like, you know, my mom was getting married um, to my stepdad. Um, and they were moving to Germany. So I, I had, like, a better support network still in Columbus. I still had people that I, had, that I knew that were going to go to Ohio State. And so I was like, this seems about the best move. And I was I was waiting for Notre Dame and they, they just took too long. And then the, the irony about all of it is, is I committed to a house that I want to say like on a Wednesday and about an hour later, Notre Dame called and said, hey, I know it's late in the process, but we'd love to get you in for a visit. And I was like, nope, I'm good. Like, oh, I'm man. sorry, I just committed to a house today and I'm sticking with my commitment and I'm not even reopening it up. I'm good. Like, so thank you. And I, I told him, I said, you know. If you had caught me like a month ago, I was like, I'd have been all in, but I'm a Buckeye. And well, I'm they, they they could have offered you NIL money maybe back then. They couldn't do it back oh, then. But we'll, we'll, money yeah, like, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I want to show you this first of all. So it just showed you the Bills one. Here we go. You remember this? There he is, everybody. I remember that one. <laughs> There's Marlon Kerner. Now you look that. See, you look mean in that picture, man. That's like you. Somebody said, put your so, game face on. I had a smiley face one. I had all these pictures. And then he's like, you got to look mean. I'm like, man, I'm a quarterback. Like, I got the scowl going and then that was it. So who were the, who were the big players at that, um, that high school of yours? You said, so I, so there was four guys from my high school that went to Ohio state and played football there. So wow. the biggest name um, is Terry Glenn. So I went to high school. I was you and Terry school. high school teammates, high school teammates. I threw, wow. I threw Terry the ball. And that's high cool, man. That's really, that's, that's and awesome. Then, and then he came out the next year. And then we had another guy um, who came out with Terry. His name was Jason Gwynn, um, 6'4", 260, defensive tackle, was going to be a force. He ended up um, passing away tragically in a, yes. a, a, an automobile accident at Ohio State. But he would have been another first-round draft pick that came out of Ohio State. So it was we all played on the same high school team. And then his brother, Anthony, went to Ohio State a couple years later. So Anthony was my backup quarterback. Um, and he ended up coming to Ohio State and played safety. So we were in the same in the same defensive back room um, together. And I so I had known him for years um, and played a lot of football with him. So those are the four guys that went to Ohio State. And then um, we had another guy named June Henley, Charles June Henley. Um, Ohio State wanted him to play corner. He wanted to play running back. So he went to Kansas um, and played football there and actually set the Kansas rookie, um, the freshman rook, rushing record at Kansas, um, like 1,100 yards as a freshman. Um, so we had a lot of talent um, in my high school room um, and my high school teams and sent countless guys to a lot of Mac schools. Uh, so it was just pretty amazing. And also a fun fact, um, Paul O'Neill from the Yankees um, was also a graduate of my high school, wow. which is Brookhaven High School. So I we have so many guys and it's such a, a, a rich tradition that came out of Brookhaven um, that I, I just think like, man, it's 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 unreal to think about the amount of guys and to send four guys from one one high school team to Ohio State to play football. And then we all ended up playing around the same time with each other was actually pretty cool. I think uh, Cleveland Hill here in Chictawaga, where I went, had one NFL player maybe about 20, 10 to 15 years ago. Can't remember his name, played for the Broncos, but one NFL announcer, too. That would be me. Uh, now, you were – I, I – I, just want to get a little somber for a second and I apologize, but I need to ask you how, how close you were with Terry, because obviously he passed away tragically as well. Um, I think we, we all kind of stayed in touch. And then 
I ended up coming to Buffalo. He ended up going to Dallas. Yeah. I hadn't talked to Terry in a while. Um, and then I, I want to say probably a year before his passing, he ended up texting me out of the blue, like, yeah. cause everybody called me Kern. So he's like, Kern, this still your number. And I'm like, who was this? And he's like, oh, this is Terry. I'm like, yeah, Terry was good. And so we were just kind of trying to catch up um, and, and trying to make plans to like reconnect when we were kind of going to be somewhere near each other. Uh, and then I got the news that he passed yeah. away um, probably like a year later. And I was just like, wow, like you just don't, un- you never know how fragile life is going to be. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I tell people like cherish your loved ones, um, make sure you tell people you love them. Um, Cause I, it was like deja vu thinking about hearing about Jason um, when he passed away in a car re- car accident. And it was the same thing. We had literally just had practice and we broke for practice and they all, we were all supposed to go out to a club and, I had a girl I was dating and she was like, you always go out and hang out with your friends. You never hang out with me. You know, you get the, you need to spend time with me. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll hang out with you. So we hung out and I didn't go out with them. And then I get the phone call early that morning oh, wow. that he passed away. And I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Cause I would have been there. I would have been out there with them and probably in the vehicle with them um, as a mess. So, so you never know just how fragile life's going to be. And I, I always think about that, like, man, like, could I have done anything to prevent that? Cause I would have been there as kind of like the older, the big brother to be like, no, let's not do that. Let's do this. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of, you just think like, man, I, I, I don't know how I would have handled the situation, but yeah, to lose two guys like that. Well, and, and actually three Corey, right. I mean, Corey, yeah. obviously Corey passed away from the heat exhaustion situation. Yeah. I mean, th- but that's a little different because right. um, I watched that fold out in real life when you started hearing about it. And, and I, I know Corey, I know how Corey is. Um, as a player, and I'm like, and, and how we were brought up um, with that, we always push ourselves um, culture, right? That was how it yeah. was like, suck it up. You can go through it. Like, okay, you're like, you don't think that you're, you know, the heat is going to be something that can be detrimental to your health. Uh, and so that was one of those things. Cause I mean, we grew up in, I grew up in Columbus and it, it, it gets 95 and we practiced in that. Like they didn't, they didn't cancel practice in there. Right. We, we full pads going in that. So you know, and I, I can put myself in the shoes like I would have done the same thing and pushed right through it. Um, and unfortunately, it ended up being the one thing that pushing through it is the wrong thing you should not do. But right. So counter to what we were taught growing up, drink water, you'll be OK, you'll do you'll be all right, you'll be all right. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, wait a minute, this can kill you. And but his death changed a lot of protocols and made That's right. be more aware of it. So at least there was something good that came out of if you can say there's a silver lining like his 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 death changed the protocols, even what the NFL does on how they treat and, and look for signs of heat exhaustion. Um, so it's an unfortunate situation. But, yeah, I mean, it's just it's crazy to see how things things kind of play out. So I just try to make sure that I really appreciate and love on the guys that were in my locker room and, and my family, because, you know, when it, when it's your time, it's your time. Yeah. And obviously tragic, you know, all around right there. And um, you've played with some great talent. I have that 95 draft here for you and I'm going to read it to you, but let me remind everybody sports city pizza pub, 1407 Niagara street in Buffalo. Great wings, great pizza. Check them out whenever you get a chance. Um, That 95, you were right. You, uh, you had it here. You talked about it. Joey went eighth. Corey went 24th in Minnesota. Then Craig Powell linebacker went 30th to Cleveland. Chris Sanders uh, wide receiver, right? You talk about him. He went right before you said that 67. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Come on. And you went 76. Lorenzo Styles also in that draft. Yes. Uh, linebacker goes to Atlanta. Preston Harrison never actually had an NFL career, but he was drafted uh, by the Chargers. And then Tito Paul was the last uh, Ohio State guy drafted that year as a, a, a fellow DB of yours. Fellow DB of mine. Yeah. Tito was from Kissimmee, Florida. Okay. Um, and I was like, oh, Tito. And he would, we would talk about, he was like, I, we, he would go to Orlando, um, Disney and talk about uh, all the theme parks and just, <laughs> good dude, good athlete, uh, really good friend. Like we just had so much fun. Yeah. We were just a we were a close knit group. Uh, and, and you know, the draft is just so crazy because you never know who's going to draft you. He ironically went to Denver, and that's the team that I had the most conversations with throughout the entire draft process was the Broncos. Like all I heard from them was we don't have a pick on day one. Um, they had traded him away uh, to get the year before to move up to get somebody. So they didn't have a pick until the fourth round um, on day two. And for, uh, for fortunately for me, Buffalo liked me enough to say, we're, we're taking you off the board with the 76 pick. But, you know, it's just one of those things. And I think Tito ended up going to Denver um, out of the blue. So so you never know full circle. It's just 
one of those things, the draft process is it's fun to be a part of. It's it's interesting. There's no science to it. Right. It's just however you get ranked on boards, teams will be like, hey, I like that guy. He's pretty good. He was close to the guy we liked before. Let's go ahead and draft him. Marlon, it, it, tell me who the greatest football player you ever shared a field with, whether it was a teammate or if it was somebody on the other side. And if it is a teammate, which is fine, you want to say Terry Glenn, that's great. Then give me the other side too. So give me one of each. Maybe the greatest player you ever played with could be offense, defense, and the greatest player you ever saw play live on the same field with you shared a field with. I I, I think the, the greatest player um, that in I- In college ever, only, in college, college. College only? Yep. Ooh, okay. Well- in college, ooh, that's a tough one. Even if they even if they had a great college career, what I like to say is sometimes you don't realize how great guys are. Like you watch them, maybe they didn't have the greatest career at the end of the day in the numbers, but you know, because it's easy to say like you're on the field with Tom Brady for somebody, but you know, I mean, you know, in college, Tom Brady wasn't spectacular. No, Tom Brady wasn't spectacular. I would tell you, like, the one player that was just like he he made runs that you just watched, like, wow, like this dude is special. Um, when Penn State came to the Big Ten, um we talk about the talent in Ohio. Yep. Kajana Carter yeah. is an Ohio guy. He's a Columbus guy. He grew up. He went to West of, I want to say, I think West of North, um, one, one of those West of schools. Um, and we all kind of knew each other. We all kind of went around in the same circles. We all kind of like would talk about who's getting recruited where. And Ohio State really wanted Kajana to come and play there. But Kajana was like, no, I think the best situation for me is to go to Penn State. We played them down uh, at Penn State in Happy Valley, and they literally put a uh, hurting on us. Um, they did so many great things. They, it was kind of one of those like close score within range after the first quarter. I want to say it was like t- 21 to three or 21 to something. And all of a sudden it was like 35 three at the halftime. You're like, oh, <laughs> this game is out of whack. Like it was unreal to kind of watch how it played out. Uh, but Kajana is one of those guys that I always think about that from an opposing team of like, this guy is the real deal, but I'll, I'll give you Kajana. And then Mike Allstott, like Ooh. Mike Allstott was really, you know, we, we, cause we had to play him and Purdue, we played him every year. That's right. And I mean, he was a load to bring. Um, and I, I never shied away from con- Like I don't shy from contact. I'm trying to come and hit you. And I remember plenty of times coming to try to hit Mike Allstott. And I remember hitting them once, and my my hel- that helmet right beside me, I'll point that, that, that way. Yeah, that helmet right there <laughs> is when I played in. And I hit him, and it turned like this. And I had the face mask and everything going this <laughs> way. And it was, like, up on my eye, and I could see stars. I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's a load. But Mike Allstott was one of those underrated guys, had an amazing football career, but underrated. Uh, he was an underrated load um, that guys kind of slept on, but – we knew when we saw Mike Goss, like, like, look, this dude's gonna try to punish you. So that was one of the guys we, we that we played against. And I was just like, wow, he was he was amazing um, to run and and have fun playing against. I think teammate wise, I mean, Joey Galloway was just a physical specimen. Um, he was just one of those guys that I mean, and we talk about he he could do everything really good. <laughs> like right. he was, I mean, we talk about he could catch footballs, he could run routes. He was so fast. He made me become such a better athlete because you don't under like I thought I was fast coming out of high school. Like I, I could run a four four no problem. Joey had this. He had a speed where he could run fast, and you'd be like, okay, we're neck and neck, we're running. And then when the ball's in the air, he had another gear that he could turn on and just accelerate past you while you're running full speed and then just leave you and pass you and be like, how the heck did he do that? So then I learned how to get another gear by trying to guard him in practice because he did it. And I was like, wow, it was amazing, but amazing athlete. I thought we talked about the four one seven that I officially saw. Um, some people say it's four two. He ran an electronic 40. He ran a four, four flat electronic 40 with a parachute strapped to his back after tearing his ACL. <laughs> Dude, that's, and you played, you played with Eddie George too. When I played with Eddie George, Eddie. Like Sean Springs, yeah. Orlando Pace. Um, I had, we had so many guys that just would come through Ohio State. Wait, was, was did you play with Herb Street or was he a little before you? I played with Herb Street. Herb Street was there my <laughs> freshman year. I had Herb Street, um, Kent Grand, 
uh, he went to the Giants. Um, and played. you know who I remember? They the, the year before you started, you would you been maybe you didn't redshirt, right? I didn't redshirt. Okay, right. so okay, but ninety two, um, Ohio State comes to Syracuse. I'm on campus. Robert Smith was the running back then. Robert Smith was a beast. He was. He I played was, with Robert Smith. He was a stud because <laughs> he, he played. He came in as a freshman, turned it out, sat out his freshman year. There was like some issues going on. I think in ninety four, he sat out. And then came back and uh, or came, let's say that was ninety no because I was ninety one at Ohio State. He sat out a year and then came back. Um, right. And then I was just like, look, Robert Smith is uh, yeah he long strider, amazing yeah. athlete. But we had him. Raymond Harris was an amazing running back. Um, we called him Quiet Storm. Um, he he. I mean, it was just Ohio Ohio State just had a lot of talent, um, and they brought a lot of guys in from Ohio. And that kind of set the run to allow guys to start looking at Ohio State and the difference. We never won a national championship. We got close um, to going to the uh, the the Rose Bowl. Uh, we ended up losing to Michigan. Ugh, can't believe we lost mm. to Michigan. But we we tied Wisconsin, <laughs> and so that was when they still had ties in college football. Yeah, so it was pretty crazy to think that we tied Wisconsin, and all we had to do we controlled our own destiny. If we beat Michigan the following week, we go to the Rose Bowl. We end up being 10 one and one and because we hadn't gone to the rose bowl in like 25 years and wisconsin hadn't gone in 34 years they got to go to the rose bowl oh um, that was how they decided it um and the following year like i think a year or two you guys go to the holiday holiday bowl yeah we go to byu yeah wow and I play like the worst game of my my entire collegiate career up to that point. Really? So, yeah, because I was coming off an injury. Um, I had um, messed up my knee in that Michigan game, so I was I wasn't hundred um, percent. It was the funeral. Um, Jason had passed. We were pre- preparing for that bowl game. Jason prepared. He passed, so I had to. I spoke at his funeral, and so I, I and I swapped numbers, and I wore forty nine for that game. Wow. Um, cause he, I was 46, he was 49. Yep. Um, so I was like, I'm wearing 49 as a tribute to him. Um, so mentally I should have spoken with our, 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 all, all the, all the mental health coaches that you can think of, because all I want to do is play so well in this game in honor of his memory. Um, but I was all over the place. I wasn't focused. I was trying to like, all right, protect your knee. But I was like, I got to play for Jason. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to do this. And I saw so I wasn't focused. I didn't breathe. I was just all over the place. And you know how it is when you get when you get scatterbrained, yeah. you make mental errors. You don't yep. do and play the way you should play because you're trying to kind of make up and compensate for a past mistake because you want to live up to the memory of your of, I want to live up for Jason's memory. So I played terrible that game. I was just I was all over the place. Um, and then I ended up making the play at the end of it. We knew it was going to happen. Um, and I was just like, okay, we made the play and we won, but I had to go back like, man, I stunk it up, but I was like, I just wanted to win for him. And we, and so I was glad Raymond Harris cared us that game. He rushed for like 200. It was like a holiday bowl record, like 250 something yards that game. He ran wow. all over the place. He, he single-handedly won the game for us. So thank you, Raymond, quiet storm <laughs> for what you did. And I'm glad we won the game in honor of Jason, but I learned so much about how to kind of deal with loss and grief um and then i ended up coming up with my own loss and grief the following season um when i was pressing through my senior year trying to become a better trying to play for the wrong reasons and then i had my aunt pass tragically she was murdered in the middle of the season um and so that helped me kind of resell recalibrate my season and kind of get me refocused on why i played football where which, where, where where did that happen um in columbus so um so that story was we i was i was forcing it trying to like solidify draft status, trying to play and prove that I'm I'm a draftable corner. And again, not playing well. Technique wasn't what it was, that what it should have been. Um, just making simple errors. And and so we played Michigan State. And I remember just talking to my aunt because I would either call my aunt or my mom. And we would just kind of talk before the night, before every game. And so I, I was talking to my aunt, and that's when you had call waiting. And so you could hear, remember back in back when we were coming up, you could hear the phone click for call right. waiting. Right. And so her phone just kept clicking and clicking and clicking and clicking. And so after we talked about maybe 35 minutes, I'm like, listen, somebody really wants to get a hold of you. Like, go ahead and talk to them. And I'll I'll talk to you tomorrow when I get back from the game. We're at Michigan State. And we ended up winning the game. I played uh so so. 
um, in that game. It was one of those games where I always use this game as an um, as something to tell younger players of and, and coaches. Make sure when you explain something, you don't explain it the way you understand it. Right. You explain it the way you you want. You explain it the way the player will understand it. Right. That's and right. so yeah. so my That's coach cool. would always be like, keep the guys in front and break on the ball. Right. And so as a corner, he's like, don't give them anything deep. Keep the ball in front, break up and make the tackle. So we played Michigan State that game and they kept running hitches. And he's like, keep the ball in front and don't and break up on the ball. So I did that. Like I he didn't he never challenged my cushion as a corner. So I just backpedal. And then when they threw the ball, I broke up and make the tackle. But they were driving down the field. So what he really meant was. If he's not going to break your cushion, slow down and let him close up to you and then you break up the pass, right? But he didn't say that to me. So so I'm going off of all all the work we did and how we did it in training camp leading up all season long. You never change it up. You just said, Marlon, what are you doing? So – we ended up, I we ended up flip flopping with you know the number I think what seventh or eight overall pick the following season or a couple of seasons later in Sean Springs. So Sean understood the concept and Sean was like, "Hey, what? How you want to play it is this way?" I'm like, "Well, he didn't say that because we talked about it afterwards." We're like, he didn't say that. Well, he meant this, but that's not how I interpreted it because how he coached me to play it is the way I played it. That's right. So, so that's kind of one of those. Coach, do you do what you're, you you did what you were coached to do. A natural reaction for me to be like, you coach me to do it this way. When I get into a a, a pressure situation, I'm going to play the way you coached me. So if I play it wrong, it's, you probably coached me something that we didn't go through and I didn't anticipate it. So I did it. I got to tell you this story. So, you know, I was in Florida coaching for a while and I coached high school football in Florida and we had this really, really good player who was only in 10th grade, but we put him on varsity and I was coaching varsity DBs at the time. And, you know, he's young, but he was good. And so, so one of the first practices we're running Pascal and it's seven on seven for everybody who doesn't know what that means. So it's just seven on seven, you're running passing plays. And I'd say to them, I said, listen, when they come out in trips, I need you over the number three receiver, one, two, three, or over the number one receiver. I said, number one receiver, one, two, three. He goes, okay, coach, I got it. Break the huddle. They come out in trips. He's like over the slot guy. I'm like, Steven, Steven. Over there, number one, number one, got on the outside. Oh, okay, coach, I got it, right? <laughs> come back, break the huddle again. They come out and trips the other side, and now he's like in no man's land. And now I'm getting mad. Steven, what what, what do you not understand? I just explained to you, one, two, three. And s- swear to you, Marlon, he looked at me and said, coach, there's nobody wearing jersey number one. <laughs> and I said, that's my fault. That's my <laughs> fault. Because we coaches, we assume that that's we that's right. The players speak their language. And that's right. Coach speak. He's but in 10th grade. I, I mean, he didn't yeah, know. He, know. <laughs> he, he probably never heard anything because they don't never they don't always teach those concepts that's at right. Little League, right? And so right. we like, oh, this is the number one receiver. He's looking at the number one. Like he's looking at the, the number, number one, one receiver. <laughs> he had one on his jersey. You said get over number one. <laughs> Like he did that. <laughs> oh my God. That's listen, funny. listen. Um, I, this was so good. I wanted to get into like NIL and transfer portal, but we could spend a lot more time. Let's do this again sometime after the draft. We'll kind of look back at what the Bills Absolutely. did. I think they're probably gonna, you know, take a receiver uh and we can kind of di- dissect that. This was so good, man. You so. So, there's I so many great stories. Yeah, me too. I know, right? I mean, is there a guy you like the best here before we leave? I like um Rome Adunze. Um I mean, you love Marvin Harrison, of course. He went to Ohio State. Obviously, but he's not gonna be there. He'll be right. off the board early. I think Adunze will be off the board early. Um, you'd have to move up. You gotta package some picks and move up. And so I don't know draft capital wise if it one makes sense because you still have other holes. And it is a deep wide receiver draft. So I think you can probably get a gym late uh in there or even pick up a tight end or somebody else to kind of use in conjunction with Kincaid. Like there's, you have some options. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how they go um, with it, but, um, and don't forget we have June 1st. So I'm not as far, like, I I don't, if they move up or don't move up, I'm good either way. Like I'm one of the fans, like if you keep the draft collateral, that means you're going to fill other holes um, at a cheap premium and get them for a longer, a longer haul, as opposed to trading away picks to pick up somebody who, I mean, it's still 50, 50. You don't know, if that person's going to pan out and it may take them a couple of seasons, a couple of seasons or years really to kind of pan out and figure out and get acclimated to the game and kind of get caught up to catching Josh's fastballs and all those things and the routes and the checks that they, that goes into it. Cause it's a lot of nuances with their offense. So 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to the draft. Listen, so. I mean, if anybody wants to go follow Marlon uh, on social media, it's at Marlon Kerner four six. Uh, you got the number there at Marlon Kerner four six, and uh, he's on Twitter right there on social media. And as much as I like knew a lot of your story, I, this was fascinating tonight. I learned a lot more about like that other. We, you have probably a lot more stories. We'll get into that. We'll talk about NAL yeah. and Portal and uh, get it. I love college football talk as well. But dude, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate yeah, it. It's really cool. Let's um. Let's get together again after the draft. We'll dissect what the Bills did, okay? Okay. We can definitely right. do that. All right. You got it.